Do you want me to get my? Is Amber's mic on? Is it blue? OK, great. We can't see. <laughs> Yeah. Great, great. So we're going to get started. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to our monthly community tour at the Art Gallery of Alberta. Uh, this month, we are very excited to welcome back Amber Paquette to lead our tour. My name is Michael Magnuson. I am the Public Program and Outreach Coordinator at the Art Gallery of Alberta. To start this program, I would like to do a land acknowledgement. We are currently in the AGA building, which is in Treaty 6 territory in Edmonton, the traditional land of a diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Inuit, and Ojibwe, Salto, and Anishinaabe. We acknowledge and extend gratitude to the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit who these lands for generations and who continue to call this place home today. We are currently in the exhibition, Here I Am, Can You See Me? by George Littlechild that features a series of 22 drawings of First Nations children who have, may have perished while attending residential school in Mascochese, Alberta. The exhibition gives remembrance, recognition, honor, and validation to the thousands of innocent children who lost their lives in the residential school system. This program is happening both online and in person. If you're attending online and would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom Q&A function to ask your question. Uh, which we will get to at the end of the program. This program is made possible in part through support of the Heart and Soul Fund by EPFOR. I would also like to thank the Canada Council for the Arts for their contribution for digital programs. Now I will introduce Amber. Amber Paquette is a Cree and Métis multidisciplinary artist, filmmaker, and the sixth historian laureate for the city of Edmonton. She was born and raised in Edmonton, Alberta. Amber has worked as an artist, writer, educator, and storyteller for several years. Her work with the public has centered on the historical representations of the First Nations and Métis communities, as well as her own contemporary expression of Cree and Métis identity in the visual arts. Without further ado, take it away. Thank you so much, um, Kanse. Hello, thank you so much for coming out and braving the cold. Um, it's really brave of you all, um, especially to come out um, and kind of acknowledge and recognize and experience a space um, that is Here I Am, Can You See Me by George Littlechild. Um, this exhibit has been, uh, it's an inauguration one, so it's a first, um, I believe, that it's, it's ever been shown to the public. Um, and hopefully will be shown in many more places. Um, so George Little Child was very much um, inspired to do this work primarily from his own family background, his own life and cultural experiences. Um, he did this work before the recent findings um, in Kamloops, and those were the 215 unmarked graves of indigenous children uh, in Kamloops. Um, since then, I think it's very important to note that there has been thousands more children found since then, and the number of those children and their graves is up past 7,000 now. Um, and according to the TRC, it was only 3,000 children who attend, or um, it was only 3,000 children who may have died in these schools. Um, but these most recent findings, of course, reflect a very different and very harrowing reality. Um, I am a third generation um, residential school survivor. My great great grandmother, Marie Rose Cardinal, attended the St. Albert Residential School, which was known as the Uvel Convent. Um, and I, I don't, I did not get to know her, unfortunately, but the, uh, the legacy um, and the violence of these institutions very much lives on through my family in the trauma that we had to suffer as well. Um, so this is a very hard space to be in, I think for many of us. Um, 
that this is part of the truth part of truth and reconciliation um, that we, we absolutely have to face and we have to acknowledge. Um, so with that, I would really love to kind of just introduce you to, the, to, to this exhibit and, and the works that are in here. Um, as I mentioned before, it's just called Here I Am, Can You See Me? Um, George Little Child very much wanted to give faces to these unmarked graves. Um, through his own project, through his own kind of story of trying to find himself, he, he was the 60 scoop survivor. That meant that he was taken forcibly from his own family and went through, you know, four foster homes and, and lived through unmanageable, um, you know, trauma. Um, so he had left, he lived with that himself. Um, and when he would go to the archives and see the thousands of photos there of First Nations children, um, none of them had names. So he would go to the community where he is from, Masquatis, um, which is formerly known as Hobima, and he would show these photographs to the elders who were there and ask them if he knew who they were. Um, and of, oftentimes they, they did know and they could name who they were, but some children, they did not have names and people did not know who they were. Um, and so he wanted to know who those children were, uh, what happened to them. Um, and, and that's kind of where this, this whole body of work was birthed out of. <clears throat> um, just right here, uh, I'll, I'll kind of just say this out loud for those who can't really see it. Um, here I am, can you see me? In reverence, we are deeply saddened by the discovery of over 5,000 indigenous children's bodies found in unmarked graves at Indian residential school sites across Canada. This timely exhibition by Plains Cree and artist, George Littlechild seeks to honor these lost lives. Over the course of his 40 year career, Little Child has been committed to righting the wrongs that First Nations people have endured by creating the works of art that focuses on cultural, social, and political injustices. The work in this exhibition includes a series of drawings of First Nations children, graves, and the discharge records of those who attended the residential school in Musquachis, Alberta, formerly known as Hubima. Pictured as well are two priests and two nuns who were some of the many who controlled these children's lives and how they were treated. The exhibition also includes intimate photographs of Little Child's family members, his mother, Rachel Little Child, and two uncles, all of whom experienced the trauma that residential school system firsthand, in addition to six other siblings. After being released from the school at the age of 16, his mother was allowed to leave the reserve and move to Edmonton. As a residential school survivor, she suffered from post-traumatic stress and died tragically at the age of 37 on Skid Row. Edmonton's 97th Street, his uncles, or sorry, his uncles, Alfred Littlechild and Louis Littlechild, however, were among the lives lost much earlier. They died as children at the Ermitskin Indian Residential School. In the artist's words, I want to give remembrance, recognition, honor, and validation to the thousands of innocent children that nobody is able to recognize as they stand amongst their fellow residential school students in the photographs, all but forgotten, in museum and archival collections. In this manner, I seek to legitimize their lives and restore modicum and dignity and importance to their short existence in the world. My heart is sickened by the discovery of these unmarked graves and the atrocities that went on across Canada at Indian residential schools. I am shocked by the number of deaths these innocent children, a tragic and sad part of Canada's treatment towards its Indigenous populations. Um, and moving on with that, um, this is a photo of George's uh, mother, Rachel, who did attend um, the uh, Erminskin Residential School. Um, so moving on forward, this photograph um, was one that was taken from the residential school that his, that his family attended. Um, this is his mother, uh, Rachel. Um, and I believe um, from what George told um, kind of the community himself, um, that his grandmother had 12 children and nine of them were taken forcibly to residential schools um, in which two of them would die um, and one of them would live with, you know, of course, horrific stories of what happened in these schools. Um, I'm not sure if anyone is not familiar with what residential schools are, but those were systemic institutions that were created in order to 
separate Indigenous children from their parents and their communities and their families in order to, in order to honestly assimilate them into Canadian society. Um, it was a form of cultural genocide and, and even very real genocide, especially considering what happened in these schools. And they're not even schools. I, I, I don't even consider them really institutions. I, I more consider them what George said, uh, labor camps. <clears throat> so a brief history. Um, for almost 150 years, 1863 to as recently as 1998, the Canadian government funded more than 130 residential schools. In 1998, that's like Spice Girls for context. <clears throat> um, until 1969, many of these schools were operated by Christian churches. They were also operated by the Anglican churches and the United Church, but it was primarily the, the, the Catholic Church and the Old Blades. Um, these schools were forcibly, uh, these schools forcibly separated Indigenous children from their families and isolated them from their communities and their cultures. During that time, more than 150,000 Indigenous children in Canada, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit attended these schools. Abuse continued as long as schools were in operation and students received cruel and sometimes. By 1900, there were 20,000 children in Indian boarding schools, and by 1925, that number had more than tripled. The stated purpose of this policy was to kill the Indian, save the man. By 1960s, the policy likely separated thousands of its indigenous children from their families. Many children never returned from their schools. 2015 report, 2015 report by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission documented 3,200 children who died while at residential schools, but the number of deaths could be 10 times higher, which is very true considering what we have recently found. We encourage visitors to learn more about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 94 calls to action. It is each Canadians' responsibility to learn more about this part of their history and familiarize themselves to have a better understanding of the situation. Once we have all shared understanding of the truth about what has happened, the more we can move forward to reconcile our current situation. History creates a context of today. We have to understand what happened in the chapters before us to know where we are in this huge collective story. <clears throat> so moving on to the first piece, we have a unidentified child from the Ermanskin Indian Residential School. Um, so that school was in Hobima or Moskwachis. Um, Moskwa means bear, Machi is hill. So it, it means the bear hills or Amisk and Wachi were the, were the beaver hills. So they're the bear, the bear hills. Um, he described that this piece, um, he is, George is gifted uh, with being able to see auras. Um, and so he said that he, he kind of blanketed a lot of the children and, and even the priests in, in this aura, um, and specifically in red to represent uh, the blood of Jesus Christ, um, the soul, their souls, which, is, which are literally being reaped um, you know, by these priests and certainly not saved. <laughs> um, he's kind of have elements in the cross in this one, this girl, she's kind of before her transformation going through the school. Um, the three children here, kind of in their Sunday's best, as it was called, um, they're kind of going through that process of assimilation, you know, cultural degradation. Um, and each, each one is, you know, unidentified child, number two, an unidentified number child, number three. And he has, a theme of windows and doors. Um, and that is to represent a lot of the stories of just children being trapped in these prisons and just looking out and wanting to be out into the world and, and being physically trapped. Um, This one as well, unidentified child from Ermanskin Indian Residential School, number four. Heavy theme of doors, windows. I like that he has his piercing still in this one. <clears throat> this one is described as a, um, a, a, a communion. She's going for her first communion. Um, kind of hence the veil. 
what I love the most about George's art work is the piercing, penetrating eyes of each individual um, and how they really are just kind of really looking through you and, and really do give almost voice and animation to these people and these poor children that we only ever get to read about. George Little Child um, did this piece on one of the priests who were in the photographs that he, he studied. He doesn't know the name, um, but each kind of scratch here, each tick tally is a representation of the, you know, the souls he's collecting. Um, and again, just that, that aura of red. In this one too, he's got, um, you know, the symbolization of the cross, but he kind of changes the cross in each, in each piece. Um, this one, um, she has in the background pieces of porridge, little pieces of porridge. Um, and that is because the food that the children were eating in these schools was absolutely horrendous and atrocious. Uh, it was usually porridge, usually rancid porridge. Um, they were poorly, poorly fed. They went to bed hungry. They lived hungry. They worked hungry. Um, these children were intentionally starved. It wasn't like there was a lack of food. Um, the priests were eating it up. The priests and nuns were literally having banquets and feasting, um, often on rations that were withheld from these children's own communities. Um, so while their parents were starving, these children were also starving. Um, so he has that represented there. George said that he went to um, the, uh, the graveyard that is in Mosquitches um, to, to draw these. And they are unmarked graves um, that are they're there on the mound. And, um, you know, it's just so surreal that and that's all that's left of just such a sparkling life, just this just snuffed out. Um, and there's more being found, of course, with the most recent technology, um, where now you just see these, you know, horrowing, you know, tracks of a field that were once empty, and now they're just being dotted with little flags, and each one being a tiny little person. And like, these are little children. I have three children. Um, one of them's three months old, one of them's three. Some of the youngest children taken were three years old and I fathom, maybe I can, maybe we all can, we don't want to. Um, but that pain is, there is no measure to that. Um, and, and George often would say that trying to do this work was immensely difficult and hard for him. It's, it was really emotional. He had to take a lot of breaks um, and he had to allow himself to, 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 to grieve doing this work. Um, it's, it's, it's a lot to even, even talk about it. And I think a lot for us to even absorb. Um, so of course, take time for yourselves with this information. Um, another one, heavily influence of you know, doors and just that feeling of that door being closed, their future, done. That door was closed, that door was over. They had no one to, you know, give them any sense of purpose or being or identity. That was over for them, these poor children. Uh, this is another first communion piece. I'm not reading the name of each piece only because each one is the same. They're going by number. And I think that's important uh, and symbolic because these children were not called by their names. They were stripped down of their identities down to their very names um, and only called by number. And were even told to sew their numbers into their clothing. Can you imagine? Uh, this piece here um, in the background, can anyone kind of see what it is? I'm not sure from afar, um, but this is like a little, lice like a little and these are lice eggs um 
And these children, when they were taken and plucked out of their, they're ripped, not plucked, uh, ripped out of their families, um, they were brought into these schools and their hair and their braids were cut off, uh, cut short, and they were deloused, um, thrown chemicals in their faces and their poor little bodies and their, their hair. Um, and the cutting of the hair was deeply traumatizing and, and also deeply symbolic that that was a, a sever of power to one's spirit in connection with mother earth. Uh, we wear our hair long and we do not cut it. We do not, we do not let other people touch our hair even because it's just so powerful in representation of who we are. Um, you only usually cut it if you're grieving. Um, you, other than that, you just leave it the way that it is. And the longer that it is, the longer it's closer is to, to Mother Earth and to the ground. Um, so that, that cutting, that severing of that, that was so much more than you know, a fashion statement. That was, that was truly spiritual abuse. And I'm quite sure they were aware of that and knew that. <clears throat> uh, this one is, uh, did she turn the other way while the priests abused the children? And did she too abuse the innocent? And she has um, the cross, which is sideways here, which uh, I heard George describe as like, that's like a no, like what happened here is like not acceptable at all. Um, and again, just like the tallies of just like the souls that these people assumedly are saving. And, and the same story here as well. And often I think we, we question like, how could these people even commit such vile and irrehensible actions against small innocent people, small children. And a lot of times these priests and these nuns, they were not even wanted by society in, at large. You know, they might've even been ex-convert or ex-convicts. You know, perhaps they had mental issues. They were often priests and nuns because they themselves had gone through perhaps less than desirable circumstances. So to put these children in the hands of these people, we're literally putting them in the hands of people who committed crimes and who knows what. This is a uh, Father Pierre Molin, bringer of souls to Jesus and God. Uh, he was French. A lot of the, a lot of the oblates were, uh, are, are French. Um, and they have a lot of records uh, of which, which are completely accessible. Some of them are not. Many of them were destroyed. Um, but the Oblates, one thing they're really good at was keeping records. And speaking of records, that is what these are. Um, George didn't include any names uh, for privacy reasons, but these are copies of the records from a residential school um, that kind of detail, you know, what grade they were in and why they were discharged when they left the school and what reason why they might have been discharged. Um, and you kind of can see here, it's you know needed at home. Then marks just mean ditto, um, sickly, time over, dead, time over, dead, sick, time over, sick, needed at home. Um, and of course, time over being, you know, you're 16, time to go, but can you imagine being there until you're 16 years of age? until you were an adult. Um, same thing here, needed at home, married. Um, oftentimes children were, um, I would say forcibly married to each other. Um, traditionally Cree, Cree people would, you know, have arranged marriages within their communities um, and had symbolic cultural meaning and were often, especially with the Cree, endoagamy, where you practice certain kinship relations, extended kinship networks. So you don't marry outside of your certain community to a certain extent. And um, these priests, you know, were, were forcibly make, you know, completely two children from completely unrelated communities, unrelated histories, um, you know, marry each other. Um, and of course, them being born in these schools, not born in these schools, raised in these schools without love and being brought together, that is, of course, a recipe for, you know, intergenerational trauma down the line, which very much happens. Um, something I experienced in my own family. Um, and this final one is just blown up into size and you know, covered with tears um, to really just you know, dead. But child gets home, sent home you know, from a school because they died. 
and, and why did they die? Um, I think is the most you know, potent question and you know, most horrifying answer, awful horrific answers. This is homage to the late Uncle Louis Little Child who died in Ermanskin Indian Residential School, 1921-1933. Auntie Tilly said he was an artist and nice looking. <laughs> Um, so George, he had two uncles that he discovered went to this school and um, they passed away and, and they don't know why. Um, this barbed wire is representative of the barbed wire and electric fence that literally was around the school. So that's not a school. <laughs> that's, that's a camp. It's, it's an internment camp. Uh, you, you, ha you had to have a pass from the Indian agent in order to leave. Um, and the coercion and the abuse that the Indian agents used um, it, it was, was irrehensible and, and oftentimes led to the reasons why these children would even be in the school. You know, the threat of having rations withheld from your whole community that you would starve if you didn't send your child to this school. <clears throat> Sister, nun, the problem. You just have all of this negative energy and arrows just into her and this poor girl who is um, his mother, I do believe. And then finally, um, my, fav my favorite piece um, is uh, I draw you for those who say residential schools never happened. Uncle Alfred, little child, your life ended because you died while young at the Ermanskin Indian Residential School of Unknown Causes, 2018. And I kind of just want to leave it there. Um, it's a lot for everyone to process, um, you know, take time for yourselves and your families to just really let this all sink in, go home and do something nice, all that stuff, because it, it is very heavy, um, but don't just pack it away and don't look back on it. Please very do think and meditate and reflect where it is, all these stories, all these truths and realities that have happened. Um, you know, and how art can often be just one of the best translations for those things that we often don't have words for. So thank you so much for having me. Bye, hi. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, what was the question? Sorry, I couldn't. I couldn't hear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's a great, fantastic question, and it reminds me that we did not pan over to the piece, the centerpiece. And I think that's probably the most important piece. Thank you. Um, this is the spirit house and it's a traditional grave and um, of the Ojibwe actually. Um, and this is just specific to them. It's not, you know, universal or anything like that. Um, but this, this house would be constructed to protect the body and the spirit. Um, you would often leave, you know, little offerings in there for the spirit. Um, as they kind of traveled over into the next chapter. And there's one of these still, and I've seen one in person. Um, there's only one that I know of in Alberta that's still standing. Um, and it's the grave of Suzanne Caraconte, who's my great, great, great aunt. And they are much larger than this. They're about three times the size. Um, and they kind of come up to about here. Uh, and you can go to Jasper Valley, you can see it today. Um, and what's fascinating about Suzanne is that she wasn't an Ishinaabe. Um, but oftentimes there was, there's a lot of cultural blending in Alberta. So the fact that she was an Iroquois lady um, who spoke Cree, who had an Anishinaabe burial practice, says a lot about fluidity in our communities. 
Um, but for the Cree, um, it really kind of just depended, like there was so many different types of burial practices. Um, and because of those, those ethnic blending and cultural blendings, it's really often hard to say, you know, specifically we did this, um, you know, down on the plains, they had scaffoldings um, where people would be placed on scaffolds and exposed to the elements and Cree culture. Um, you know, some of them had big burial interments where um, every 20 years the community would come back um, and they would turn everybody into a group communal grave. Um, and Rossdale is actually one of those places. Um, and again, like you would have the bones stripped clean um, and bundled and then sometimes carried great, great distances, um, you know, thousands of miles sometimes to be interned in these places. Um, so people deeply cared <laughs> about their remains and their ritual connections to people's remains and their children. And um, it's, it's the, the fact that we, we don't know who these children are and we don't have names for them, um, you know, that's a huge lapse, you know, in, in, in so much um, for communities that placed immense care and importance on their burial rights. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> there is, yeah, there is. <clears throat> Do we have time to, to go over? Yeah, cool. So the spirit house, most indigenous peoples believed that the souls of the dead pass into the spirit world and become part of the spiritual forces that influence every aspect of life. Various rituals, customs and beliefs, and in some cases still are performed in the care of the dead. Burial customs varied from tribe to tribe. Southeastern tribes practiced secondary bone burials. Corpses were dug, bones were cleaned and then reburied. The Eastern Great Lakes people saved skeletons of the deceased for final mass burials that included furs and ornaments from the dead spirits used in the afterlife. Northwest coastal tribes often put their dead in canoes fastened to poles. Some Southern tribes practiced cremation. In mountain areas, tribes often placed their dead in caves or fissures in the rocks. The tribes of the Great Plains region either buried them on tree platforms or scaffolds. The peoples of the far north and the east erected small gabled roof board houses over the graves called spirit houses. The purpose of the wooden spirit house was to protect the body while the soul crossed into the spirit world. These houses were built from wooden planks and featured a peak roof. A round hole was cut to the western end of the deceased spirits to escape off food offerings, tools, items of significance to the dead or placed inside or on a small shelf by the opening. Yeah, and that's there in the middle there. <laughs> Questions from, from the audience? Anybody else? <laughs> I think we're good. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank, thank you. you so much. And hi, hi for all your time and, you know, holding space for all of this. Um, and I really thank you for coming out. Um, and again, really take time to just, you know, process and, and, and heal. Um, from this night, it's, it's, it's a lot to take in. So thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Amber, from everyone at the AGA and myself and Helen included. It was a truly powerful mm -hmm. uh, tour. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And thank you so much um, for the AGA for having me. And of course, you know, deep honor and thank you to for George for doing this, this space. Um, it's such an undertaking to, you know, try and translate these stories and, and these realities in these lives and, and it's a huge honor for me to even attempt to try <laughs> and, and talk about them so thank you so much yeah i will <laughs> just mention um that this tour has been recorded and it's going to be on youtube very shortly it's also available to watch on our facebook so if you have friends or colleagues that you feel should see this tour by amber please share it with them thank you again awesome thank you